So that's no deal. Okay, could you um, tell us a little bit about the concept, uh, Supermall? Supermond, the overworld, uh, is a word I phrase because um, it's quite clearly established, I think, in American foreign policy that when it began, from my point of view, to be derailed away from defense and into offense or alternative view, like the defense of U.S. corporations overseas, um, was a, a series of actions in the 50s. We got involved in Iran on behalf of what used to be called Anglo-Iranian oil and is now familiar as BP, the people who despoiled the Gulf. Um, and uh, then right after that, uh, in Guatemala, uh, we overthrew a democratically elected government on behalf of United Fruit because the, this Arbenz government had nationalized those uh, field, those uh, areas of U United Fruit uh, uh, property that were not actually being involved in the uh, cultivation of sugar and bananas and had the audacity to reimburse the company at the rate which they had valued the land for tax purposes. So we invaded that country. Now, where does the overworld come in here? There's something in New York called the Council on Foreign Relations. And before these actions, particularly the action in Guatemala, before they were extensively uh, acted on in governmental level, they were already being discussed in the Council on Foreign Relations, which brings together, well, professors, people I know, but also uh, uh, and, and leaders in government, but along with leaders from these corporations like uh, United Fruit and uh, from the law firms that represent them, like Sullivan and Cromwell, where the Dulles brothers lived before they took a step down to become Secretary of State and uh, the head of the CIA. And uh, all these things are thoroughly discussed there first and then become policy. And the general model I wanted to suggest is that uh, historians work with documents and they chronicle how policies emerge at the governmental level, but uh, they should really also be chronicling um, at the overworld level, the level of the supra, the supra monde, and um, particularly the CIA itself was an idea, I think, which came out of the war peace studies of the Council on Foreign Relations compiled um, in collaboration with the State Department during the war. Some of those are still classified but, you know, a, a very instructive period in American history are the two years between 1945, when the OSS, which was the wartime CIA, was closed down, and then the, uh, 1947, when the peacetime CIA was first established, you had almost nothing in between. You had something, a, a kind of temporary stopgap thing called the... CIG uh, with a general Vandenberg in charge. Well, they kept rotating the generals. Uh, but in that period, I think that America's post war policy was really being designed in New York and not in Washington. And there were a series of blue ribbon commissions. Uh, Alan Dulles was on one of them, Sidney Sowers. There were, they were bankers and lawyers almost exclusively, and they were calling for the establishment of the CIA. And Truman, who had shut down the OSS, um, he created the, the CIA, um, and the uh, heads, the, 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 the first head of the CIA was uh, a rational appointment, but you look just below the first level, the, the, um, the deputy directors of the CIA, we have, I think, the names of seven, and all of them but one comes out of the Wall Street banking uh, lawyer, lawyer background. 
And in addition, I think it's just as important to say that all but one of those were listed in the New York Social Register, meaning they came from traditionally wealthy uh, ruling families. And the exception was a member from the Social Register of Boston, Cleveland. Uh, so it was really an exception that was not an exception. Robert Amory, uh, the, the Boston one. The, uh, at the beginning, not now, today, but at the beginning, the, the creation of the CIA, the, the, uh, <coughs> popular, the peopling, the hiring of the CIA, and the, even more something called OPC, which became the covert arm of opera. The, the part, of, it was eventually became part of CIA. At the time, it was called the Office of Policy Coordination, which means exactly nothing, which is what they meant it to mean. It, it began outside the CIA, but it was also almost uniquely, uh, it was run and it was staffed at the highest levels by people taking a leave of absence or leaving the big law firms and big, bank, uh, big banks. You know, see. So that's why I say you have to have a, for understand American policy, you have to have, understand that there is an overworld where the major decisions are made, including, by the way, the decision to back an army in Southeast Asia uh, that was financed by drugs. And uh, I, su I suspect, well, I'm pretty sure actually, that the same would be true for Britain or for France. There was something called the Cercle Piné, which was British and French, which uh, took credit for establishing Maggie Thatcher in, as the Prime Minister of England. And uh, I think, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak about French politics here because I'm so weak compared to the audience. Well, the law is in the toilet right now. So. But uh, the, the similar things happened in France. And then uh, a former head of French intelligence, Alexandre de Marange, uh, I think he joined the Cercle Piné. I know that he helped create something called the Safari Club, which would meet in Africa. The Safari Club is actually a hunting lodge in Kenya, but it, would, it united with, it represented there were the head of Saudi intelligence, the head of Iranian intelligence when the Shah was still in power in Iran and Savak was his, uh, his intelligence agency. This was a time when Carter was trying to get the CIA out of covert operations and had installed a Navy admiral uh, as head of the yeah, CIA. Uh, and uh, the result was they went offshore and were planning these things at the Safari Club. Well, this is another international example of what I mean by the overworld. I know that de Marange was also involved in the plans with Casey. I think they're both Knights of Malta, whether that's relevant or not. One percenters. And, but definitely the one percenters. And it was, it was a matter of public record that uh, Reagan, when he started, had his own what he called kitchen cabinet that used to meet down in uh, the L.A. area. And Alexandre de Marange, uh, finished with his stint as head of French intelligence, was part of that uh, kitchen cabinet. So it's international. Uh, they meet every year at Davos, you know, the, the one percenters. Oh, I think we're talking really about the 0.1% of the one percent. Right. These are the people who are getting really rich now and uh, who are doing very, very, they're, they're profiting very well by the kind of state of semi-terror that this war on terror keeps us involved in. And um, they, well, there's something else. Oh, yes. Also represented at Davos are people who become very wealthy from their involvement in the, mostly the money laundering side, but the, but the illicit drug traffic. This is created, there was a man called, uh, the, I'll just say illicit traffics in general. These people become very wealthy 
Pao Sriyanong was the general in charge of Thailand in the 50s, and he was also in charge of the drug traffic. And he was considered at the time to be the richest man in the world. Now, the title richest man in the world passed in the 60s and 70s to an Arab who actually came to California and started making money when he was at Chico State, uh, Adnan Khashoggi. Uh, the, the biography of him is called The Richest Man in the World, and he kept a yacht when he, when he was, he's no longer the wealthiest, uh, he's had court troubles. But, Bill Gates took care of that today. Uh, sorry? Bill Gates took care of that today. Oh, right, I didn't mean to tell you after. Uh, but I just wanted to say he kept a, uh, a yacht off, um, uh, off the coast of the Côte d'Azur in France, and it was filled with lovely young girls who were very useful in uh, helping to get politicians. Okay, now, uh, right now we seem to be having, uh, there's been a civil war that's been going on in Syria for the last year, um, and a lot of countries have tried to stay out of the war, and now there's been uh, revelations that have been coming out about uh, Western countries shipping arms to the uh, the NSA, the National, uh, what was it, the FSA, Free Syria Army, I believe is their name. Yes, well, I, th I think that America has been involved in this covertly. We have a, also this um, question about what was happening in Benghazi when the ambassador was killed there. You know, when they first um, talked about it, they said it was an attack on the consulate. It's not a consulate. Uh, ever since then, they've been calling it a diplomatic compound. Well, I'm a former diplomat. I never heard this phrase, diplomatic compound. It makes no sense to me. As far as I know, the only diplomatic compound in the world was this place in Benghazi. And what other people have said is that they were gathering the, there were all kinds of arms left over in the armories of, um, of Gaddafi and that the Americans had a double motive to get them out of Libya, which is still very unstable and it's not clear whether any government can be established there. And so uh, Benghazi was collecting the arms and shipping them on, perhaps being paid for by Qatar or else Saudi Arabia uh, to reach the Sunnis in uh, Syria. Now these would, the CIA would do this even though the, the, people, the Sunnis in uh, getting them might not be the Sunnis that we approve of. They might be the Sunnis that are uh, linked to al-Nusra, which is uh, in turn an arm of what we call al-Qaeda in Iraq. The extremists that are out to make uh, mayhem out of, to, uh, out of Syria, make it a Sunni country. The problem with Syria, of course, is that uh, like Lebanon, uh, it, it's a, a, an amalgam of many different religions, Sunni, Shia, the two big branches of, uh, of Islam, Shia. That, uh, and uh, which in the current situation where Saudi Arabia and Iran are very much mistrusting each other, uh, we've seen a huge rise in intra -vi violence inside Islam between Sunnis and Shias. That's the tragedy of Iraq right now and threatens to become, and perhaps we should say has already become, the tragedy of Syria as well. Uh, I, th I think that Obama, he, I'm not totally anti-Obama, I think he made a, he went and made a speech in Cairo one of, in the first months of his presidency, which a lot of Republicans really hated, but I thought it was a remarkably good speech. But then I think he made a very a, a remarkably, I would just say, silly speech in 2011 when he said uh, that Assad must go, just like that, the head of, well, <clears throat> I don't think he had really researched what that would mean. I, uh, I, I don't want to wait, get into the whole topic of Libya, which I have to say I was very opposed to what was done in Libya because, again, 
they decided Gaddafi must go, but they had no clear idea what would replace him, and we still don't know. And so a power vacuum there. And, uh, or Iraq, that, that the fundamental fallacy in Iraq was that Saddam must go, and there was no replacement except that this crazy man Shalabi was assuring Dick Cheney that the people will welcome democracy and they will be friendly with America. Total nonsense. But it served Dick Cheney's purposes and Donald Rumsfeld's purposes. I, I don't know if Bush was even had really counseled on this. It served their purposes to believe this nonsense. And so we created a vacuum, which is a problem for the world. And just for, the, for Obama to have gone as far as he did was uh, to increase the, uh, this, uh, the, the unhappiness in Syria. Um, and I think that uh, having said this bad thing about Obama, I want to say that I think it is excellent and imperative. And by the way, there are former American diplomats saying the same thing, that, uh, that the really the, the solution in uh, Syria is for an international conference of all the parties and all the neighbors, and that of course includes Iran. And of course it's, it's also because of the, uh, the closeness of US foreign policy to Israeli foreign policy, it's going to be very difficult to persuade um, the American political establishment that Iran has to be part of a settlement in Syria. But what's happening right now, this is May of 2013, and in June there is scheduled to be an international conference. If that conference is going to be successful, Iran is going to have to be there because they are one of the players. They are backing the Hezbollah in Syria, and uh, they have to be part of an agreement. Uh, I think that Russia and, uh, and, and the Obama administration, they've had many problems, but I think they both can see that what's happening in Syria is very dangerous, more than Libya, more than Iraq. This one threatens to uh, become a much larger war. It already is, in a sense, a kind of proxy war between, uh, on the one hand, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and on the other side, Iran. They both are committing a lot of energy to seeing their side win for the sake of their own security. Because I, uh, the, a lot of the trouble in Iraq is the same thing, that uh, Iran wants to have a Baghdad that is favorable to Iraq, and Saudi Arabia is very uncomfortable with that because they feel that for their security it has to be favorable to them. It wouldn't surprise me that a, a successful series of meetings about Syria would lead to, a, at a minimum, uh, a resolution of the Iraq problem as well, or at least a stabilization. We can't ask for everything in these international meetings but at least a stabilization of the situation in Iraq by reducing the, what I would call the legitimate fears of Saudi Arabia about Iran and the equally legitimate fears of Iran about Saudi Arabia and Qatar, particularly Qatar. Qatar is a very small country, but very, very wealthy and very activist. It played a big role in uh, upsetting the apple cart in Libya at the beginning and was buying oil out of, uh, from eastern Libya before there was a government to sell it to them. Um, all these countries have to get on the same page or we may see a larger conflict in that area, conceivably even a nuclear one, which uh, would be disastrous for the whole world but particularly disastrous for that area and, a, 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 and a, a small country like Qatar is like a small country like Israel has a special reason to want to tamp things down and not rate, get to the level of a general conflict. So it's a very important topic and it's unfortunately 
not one in which uh, people like you and me can offer the, uh, the, the magic solution. That will have to be worked out on the international level. But I think an, an understanding between Russia and America is the first step to leading to a, a, a wider understanding involving Iran and Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And I would like to see China, in, I, mean, I would like to see, uh, China has to be in there too. Because uh, just as uh, proxy war in Spain in the 1930s led to World War II, a proxy war, which is what we already have in Syria, could lead to a much larger war. And it's, it's not, the, the cost of a larger war now in an age of nuclear weapons is, is something that we have to work very hard to stop. Yeah, to be the end of human civilization. I, uh, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about the, the uh, Israeli um, and, the, and the fact that they actually did airstrikes into Syria last week? supposedly to destroy chemical weapons? Well, everybody, as I said, you know, Iran has its legitimate fears, Saudi Arabia has its legitimate fears, Turkey, we haven't mentioned, certainly has legitimate fears, Israel has legitimate fears. Uh, I have a lot I could say against Israel, but I wouldn't start with the fact that they took out a particular shipment of rockets that was destined for Hezbollah because they are, they are suffering rocket attacks and this would have meant if they had reached uh, their ultimate place, uh, there would have been a, a new generation of rocket attacks that would reach the whole of Israel, not just certain border areas. So um, I think if we're going to criticize Israel, it should be on a higher level the failure to reach a, a peace agreement with uh, Palestine in order to recognize Palestine as a state, which it should be recognized as. Um, but uh, yes, you know, every one of these states, uh, you can say terrible things about them, but you also can have sympathy for their saying, why shouldn't Iran be nervous? Uh, 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 Israel has threatened many times uh, to, the idea that they might even use a nuclear weapon against their own, the Iranian installations because they're so deeply buried, whereas uh, sanity, and um, this I'm now saying something is said by a, a, a professor um, at, uh, I think, uh, well, he's in, I forget where he is, but he, uh, geographically, he's in Jerusalem. He's an Israeli nationalist. And he says, um, A, Iran has every reason to want to have nuclear weapons as a defense against Israeli nuclear weapons. And secondly, uh, Iran will never launch a first strike against Israel because if it has five or ten weapons, that's nothing compared to the retaliation of Israel, which has somewhere between 100 and 300, that's not that's more. That's if not more. But plus, uh, I, with Iran actually had uh, glo uh, uh, global nuclear, I can't remember the agency, but it was a nuclear regulatory agency that was run by the United Nations, mm -hmm. or, it was, or, it was, or it was an ad hoc organization worldwide. And the only country in the world um, besides Israel that was dead set against it was, of course, the United States. Right. Uh, because the United States has a vested interest in uh, in Iran to capture, they you know I still believe they want the oil that's that's in the Persian Gulf. Well, I think that American politicians have a vested interest in not being too publicly opposed to what Israel wants. I don't think it's a, really an American vested interest. Uh, I think it really was an American vested vested interest to see the whole of Asia as non-nuclear, which was what. American policy was at the time, and Israel, uh, for its own reasons, and you know, I can understand their fears. They didn't want to be dependent on another power. They wanted to be auto autonomously independent, so they went ahead and developed their own nuclear capacity. And what was bad about that from an American point of view is that now everyone else wants it too. Pakistan went ahead, now they have the bomb. That meant India went ahead, now they have the bomb. 
and uh, Iran and North Korea don't want to be left out in this. It, uh, the, the best would have been, I think, non-proliferation. But you know, the, the deal in non-proliferation was that America and Russia were then going to denuclearize to reduce the threat to these other countries. And we haven't, we've radically reduced our nuclear uh, re weapons inventory because it was insanely beyond what it could be used for anything. But even the radical reduction doesn't begin to be enough of a reduction to be an argument for other countries to go non-nuclear. One country did go non-nuclear, and that was Gaddafi and, and Libya, and look what that got him. And uh, conversely now, America is having a lot of trouble with Pakistan, real trouble with Pakistan in Afghanistan and elsewhere, but it's not threatening Pakistan because Pakistan is now a nuclear power. And they just uh, they had recently had their elections. Yes, and uh, oh by the way, yes, what happened? I don't know what happened. You, you'll have to tell me. The Musharraf one. Oh well, that's probably the best. Probably the best. I think. What's the next question? Uh, how about drone strikes in, in Pakistan? We're talking about Pakistan. Yes, well, drone strikes in general. Uh, drone strikes are very good for domestic U.S. politics. Uh, you, it's, I can't imagine. It will be very hard to mobilize a majority of Americans against these drone strikes, but I, I, I hope that this can be done because drone strikes in the short run deal with immediate problems of terrorists, but in the long run they're a disaster. The, 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 it's like uh, the debate that's going on right now on the uh, the original act, what is it, the act for the application, for the introduction of military force that was passed right after 9-11. And now they're debating in Washington, that was to deal with Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda. But Al-Qaeda isn't really the problem now. Terrorism is multiplying and disseminating, going all over the world. And there are some people who are saying, oh, well, these are extensions of al-Qaeda. And then there are a few people who are more legally minded and said, well, then you have to get a new uh, authorization. And uh, whatever happens, uh, what's really wrong here is the whole concept of a war on terror, which is a, a nice way of defining a permanent, endless, eternal war. There will always be terror. If you're always going to go on fighting it, you're going to have an endless war. And if you're fighting it with drones, you're going to aggravate the problem and not reduce it. And some people don't seem to care because this war on terror is immensely profitable to this military industrial complex. It's totally changed its character now. They're not making aircraft carriers and battleships, but the same companies are making the drones each one of them cost millions of dollars. It was like uh, helicopters in Vietnam, we, we cons or B-52s in North Vietnam. We consumed an enormous number of them, and it was really, the whole strategy was wrong. It wasn't winning the war, it was helping us lose the war, but it was very, very profitable. And drones are to our current war on terror, what the helicopters were in Vietnam. It's something that aggravates the problem, makes more. Uh, Yemen in particular, Yemen is a very unstable country. Why is it so unstable? The main reason is we have concentrated so much on our, our effort on fighting terrorism there. Uh, and to the result, and by the way, this is not just me. This is studies have been done by the scholars who know Yemen far better than I do who say that Yemen's real problem is that uh, America is only interested in counterterrorism and is not, not really interested in Yemen. Uh, we need a policy that builds up a stable government in Yemen to in which dealing with terrorists is small, not huge, but um, 
anyway, so, so my feeling about drones is, and I'm not alone in this, that uh, they look good. You can have a press conference and say, we killed Mr. Aulaki, Al and then we can blame, we're still blaming things on Aulaki. We're blaming the Boston killings on Aulaki. Um, but any rational assessment of what we're doing in Yemen is that uh, we are multiplying terrorists, we're not reducing the number. You know, the policies of the United States government. And if you ask me, uh, well, I would say that the United States government is actually the world's largest terrorist involved in terrorist activities. I mean, for instance, uh, Al-Qaeda grew out of uh, the Mujahideen in, uh, in Afghanistan, and they were all completely trained by CIA operatives. Um, uh, Osama bin Laden was a CIA operative. Well, you, you, you're getting into problems with nomenclature, but something you can say as a matter of fact and not, uh, not playing with words is that the heart of uh, the Al-Qaeda base in uh, the late 80s uh, was uh, being run by the blind sheik Abdul al-Rahman in Brooklyn, and they were training people on Long Island and a man from, called Ali Mohammed, I have a whole chapter about him in my book. Uh, it's in there, The, uh, the Road to 9-11. Uh, he was a sergeant at Fort Bragg in the Special Forces. And he would spend weekends and come down and uh, train these people. And the FBI knew, and they were taping him for a while. And then, lo and behold, in 1990, they stopped taping him. He didn't stop training. He was not just you know, regular warfare. He was training them in explosives. In other words, that's terrorism, explosives. The FBI was filming all this until they stopped. And this, it's on an army website that they stopped. And the army doesn't say why they stopped, but I think even somebody with a, a very low IQ can figure out they were told to stop because this was an an operation that was countenanced by the U.S. government. As a sergeant <coughs> in the Special Forces, Ali, Ali Mohammed himself went to Afghanistan and took part in the Mujahideen War against the Russians. Well, if you're in a U.S. uniform, you're not supposed to do that. But he did it, and he, wasn't, he, was, he was honorably discharged. Not a word was said against it. And after that, he became an FBI informant. And um, he went to Bosnia and was with the uh, Mujahideen in Bosnia. Now, we've heard a lot about the Serbian massacres against uh, Muslims in Bosnia. And they were horrible. But they were also provoked that there, before that, there had been Mujahideen, not, mostly not by Bosnians, but by these Al-Qaeda type people who came in with support from inside the United States and massacred Serbs. So that what happened in, in uh, Srebrenica was uh, in a sense a kind of revenge for things that had been done against the Serbs before then. So it was not in America's interest really, well, it was in some Americans' interest, not Americans, you know, like you and me, was not in our interest uh, for what America did. Eventually it went in in a bigger way in Bosnia and ended that, that war. But then you had another war in Kosovo where America again allied with the Al-Qaeda elements, as it had been in Bosnia secretly. And uh, that was in the interest of the oil companies because after it's all over, you have this huge American base now. Uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, in the Kosovo area, and uh, a lot of cynics predicted, oh, well, that's to protect the oil pipeline they're going to build across the Balkans. And uh, people like me who said this got called conspiracy theorists. But they are now building the pipeline. And they do have a base to protect it. Just as originally in Afghanistan, there was hopes to build a pipeline through Afghanistan. And uh, the, um, 
the Taliban were seen as a way of restoring order to, uh, to Afghanistan, and uh, one of the big American oil company, Lunokal, actually paid for them to come and get uh, training in uh, oil activities here in the United States. So it's, and I, to try and sum this up, we tend to talk about things that are in the newspapers, like Syria and Mali and drones and so on. <clears throat> but there's a roof to all our behavior that we don't talk about. And I think that the, what's fundamentally wrong with US foreign policy in the Middle East is that we are totally in bed with Saudi Arabia. We buy oil from them. And more than that, it's not just the oil that comes to us, but we have a petrodollar system that we arranged with Saudi Arabia back in the 70s when the price of oil went up. Uh, the deal was that America supported that on condition that all OPEC oil would be paid for in dollars. That's what I mean by a petrodollar. And uh, this is one of the biggest markets for, we don't produce very much now in the United States. Uh, very, we don't export automobiles, we export airplanes, but even there we're losing out to Europe more and more. Um, but there is a huge need for US dollars all over the world from countries that don't have oil they have to buy our dollars to pay for their OPEC oil. And America has shown its interest in preserving this system. Uh, what did Saddam Hussein do that was so terrible? Well, one of the things he did was say that he said, from now on, if I sell to Europe, I'll take payment in euros. And uh, that was... Uh, followed quite shortly afterwards with the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And that was followed quite shortly afterwards by American bureaucrats installed in Iraq ending the payment for Iraqi oil in euros. We went back to the OPEC system of paying for it in dollars. And then Gaddafi threatened to accept there was even talk of a new Muslim gold currency. It never got off the ground, but they, they, they said, why should we have to do everything in dollars? We, we do business among ourselves. Let's do it with our own currency. Anyway, uh, Gaddafi was just hinting that he would uh, make new arrangements with the Soviet Union, with Russia, sorry. Uh, and not uh, insist on dollars, he's gone. Iran is already in a small way uh, trying to sell its oil not for dollars. We are hobbling their efforts to do that by all these new sanctions that have been imposed on Iran. And uh, this, 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 I think, also is, is dangerous, it's wrong, it's... Um, and it leads to a policy where what we do on the policy level is never very far from what Saudi Arabia wants. Saudi Arabia wants to oust an Alawite head of Syria, which is a kind of, he's not even a Shia really, he's a kind of a, of a dissenter from Shia. But the country is run by a minority of the country, the Alawites, which is, you'd say, well, that's a bad thing. Well, it's bad until you consider what's going to replace it. And it looks very much, I think, more and more people are coming to see that what, what's happening now is, which is total chaos, is about as bad as you can get. And what you can foresee in the future is also going to be bad. It's either going to be, as the way things are running presently, either like in, you know, it will be the Iraq problem all over again. Either the Sunnis are going to terrorize the Shia, or the Shia are going to terrorize the Sunnis. And you're already getting horrible, horrible massacres, which are clearly done by rebel forces, not by Assad. We read, it, read in the papers about Assad's massacres. Those are real, too. Uh, the Alawites feel very threatened 
the Christians are really losing, and there's so many of the Christians have just left because uh, they survived under Assad, and they're they're not surviving under the present, and they very much fear the the future. So that one of the people calling for negotiations before he resigned was Pope Benedict because he was very aware of how horrible this has been for the Christians. Um, so anyway, to sum this up, we say very little about the oil companies because we, we have no documents, we have no intelligence, nobody comes out or very few people come out and really uh, tell what's really happening at that level. But uh, I think when the truth is told, um, I think it's a matter of record now, really, that uh, Nixon and the oil companies were behind the first oil price increase in 1972. Uh, and it's pretty sure that Carter was not in favor of the second oil price increase in 1979, because that's really what drove him from office. That's what helped uh, elect Reagan in America and Maggie Thatcher in England. That was, I think, a, a, the results of a coordinated oil policy that we have very little documentation on. And to come back to the question about the overworld, um, the trouble is that oil companies and banks make their own policies. And we think we live in an open society, but we have no, no insight at all into what those policies are, except when it's too late. And we look back and say, oh yes, there was a concerted oil policy in 73 and 79, BP, I haven't mentioned BP, but the things they did, um, and don't get me started, it's a long story, um, but we can look back and see there were oil policies that affected our politics, and we need to somehow get our politics out in the open where uh, the, the will of the people uh, begins to have some kind of restraining effect on what I would say are the insane policies we have right now that are not stabilizing the world. My book, uh, the, um, the Road to 9-11, they said we can't use that title in France. How about Le Nouvel Ordre Mondial, the new world order. I said, that's crazy. We don't have order. We have wars all over the place. How can you call that order? Um, and I did an article once about the, how the Pax Americana is ending the same way as the Pax Britannica in more and more disorder, which it is helping to create. So my book is now called Le Nouvel Désordre Mondial. A nouveau désordre mondial, which is the new world of disorder, which is a better way of characterizing what we have. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what advice would you have to young people today um, that are committed to uh, ending this so called new world disorder? Well, first of all, mistrust the what I call the governing media, the mainstream media, because they're owned by the same people as everyone else, and they systematically suppress facts which we need to know if we're going to understand what's happening in the world. As long as we have an internet, trust, well, you have to always judge for yourself. Probably 95% of what's on the internet is garbage. But the truth, the best we have, is there too. So you have to be smart enough to know who to trust and to educate yourselves. We all have a stake in especially young people who are of military age, have a great stake in making sure that this war world does not have another world war because another world war will change history in a way that the first two wars didn't begin to. And even they, by the standards of that time, were unconscionably horrible, evil. Um, so, and to maintain contact among yourselves and uh, using Facebook and all kinds of things to network not only with people around you, but with people in other parts of the world. 
because uh, or and on the uh, for Americans, I would say uh, you you probably most of you don't read French or these other languages, but you. But the British press is far better in reporting on what's happening in America than the American press is right now. The Guardian, the Independent, almost every one of them, the Daily Mail, the, uh, the London Times, even though it's owned by Rupert Murdoch, they are uh, a good way of keeping, you can put yourself on, you know, their, on their lists. And you can read them for free on the internet, and you should. And uh, if there is hope for the world, it would be that um, there is more and more interaction among people on the, on the people level. And some of it is good things done by America. America started the Peace Corps, and a lot of people went into the Peace Corps thinking they would join the State Department and they came out and they joined instead of an environmental movement or something like that. There are lots of, there's no shortage of people of goodwill in, in our country and in every other country, including Russia, where I've just been twice in the last three years. It doesn't make me pro-Russian more than I'm pro-everyone else, but uh, I certainly want to see good relations as opposed to, I, I want to see an end of American attempts to make inroads into the former Soviet Union, which is a big source of, of that's of interest to the oil companies, because there's a lot of oil in Kazakhstan and gas in Turkmenistan and so on. Uh, those things should be developed, but they should be developed in a way that is not threatening to the national security of countries in that area. And Russia has, I think, very legitimate reasons to see itself being encircled by NATO, especially under Bush and Cheney when they wanted the Ukraine to join NATO, and they wanted Georgia to enjoy to join NATO. I mean, this the, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, has as a member a country that is in the middle of the Caucasus. This is, I mean, how crazy can you get? Well, we're a little less crazy under Obama, but we have a lot of distance to go in the direction of sanity. And your, in response to your question, this, this, we can only draw country, our government back to sanity if the people care. And there's a huge effort through controlling the media to make sure that the people don't care, that they just watch American Idol. Well. Uh, you shouldn't care. And my experience is that most of you do, well, the people I meet do care. And that's why I, I am hopeful and write books, not out of pessimism, out of despair. If the, the pessimistic response would be just to take care of myself. The optimistic hope is that we are slowly building a global community that will begin to establish a kind of decent global government in place of this ragtag mixture of states, which are not going to last very much longer. They're either going to change peacefully or they're going to destroy themselves. Okay, thank you. It's been a very interesting talking with you. I learned a lot. Yeah, well. <laughs>